Jack West, MD. I'm an associate clinical professor in medical oncology at City of Hope Cancer Center in the Los Angeles area, uh, and also founder and president of Grace. Uh, Isabel, can you tell us who you are and what you are? Sure. Um, my name is Isabel Preschigal. I am a thoracic oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and I am very excited to be here today speaking to all of you. And Joan. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Joan Schiller. I'm a medical oncologist um, living now in Northern Virginia. I was formerly the deputy director of the Cancer Center at UT Southwestern and also of the Shar Cancer Center in um, in Northern Virginia as part of ANOVA. Excellent. I'm glad to be with you. Let's turn uh, to another study. Uh, this is Checkmate 816. And this looks at giving immune therapy in combination with chemotherapy before surgery. And this is for patients with early stage resectable stage 1B to 3A disease, although a lot of patients in this study had more advanced stage 3A disease. So a pretty high risk of the, the cancer coming back. Everyone got three cycles of chemotherapy with a two drug combination. And then half the patients also got the drug nivolumab or Obdivo as seen on TV um, with their chemotherapy. And they got three cycles uh, and then went on to surgery. They had imaging before and after their uh, preoperative treatment. And then uh, we saw how they did based on how the surgery went and also uh, how things looked under the microscope. And actually, some of the earliest data that we got preceded ASCO, it was a meeting called the uh, AACR, American Association for Cancer Research, in April of this year, where uh, Dr. Ford, Patrick Ford uh, from Johns Hopkins, presented some of the data on the right side of this slide that showed that the patients who got immune therapy combined with chemo had a much higher chance of their cancer shrinking significantly on imaging from about 9% to 37% uh, or so. And when they looked under the microscope at what was left after surgery or at surgery, um, only 2% of the patients who had chemo had no evidence of the cancer with any of the viable cancer under the microscope. It was a tenfold higher uh, chance of that. 24% of patients had no evidence of any viable cancer under the microscope at surgery. So we knew that bit of information. And then uh, Dr. Spicer uh, from uh, Montreal uh, looked at results in, uh, in terms of surgery and, sh and specifically showed that the patients who underwent immune therapy in combination with the chemotherapy before surgery didn't have any harder time with the surgery. They got through it. And in fact, the surgeries were about half an hour shorter with the uh, immune therapy added. Uh, now, importantly, what they also showed was that a lot of patients uh, were able to undergo a minimally invasive surgery. Uh, so just a lot less cutting, a lot less to recover from, particularly if patients had stage 3A disease. So these are patients who are often on the bubble for whether they can safely get uh, surgery done through a big surgery or a small surgery. And as shown on the right side of this slide, uh, the question of whether they needed to just get one lobe of the lung removed, there's three lobes of the right lobe, uh, right lung, there's two on the left. It's a bigger and more, uh, frankly, disabling surgery to have your entire lung removed. But that's sometimes needed for more advanced cancers. But when the immune therapy was added, uh, the patients with stage 3A disease were considerably less likely to need to have their whole lung removed uh, and were more likely to be able to get through with, with just one lobe. Uh, on balance, they had comparable or trends toward lower complications, especially less pain and fewer uh, pre issues with shortness of breath, largely, I think, because they needed less extensive surgery uh, to get it taken out. And uh, so anyway, that's kind of where we are with this. It is not FDA approved. 
And I should say that we only have the results from the time of surgery and don't have results for how frequently the cancer comes back or how long people are alive. The results just look very good for the early time point that we're at. There's a good amount of enthusiasm about the concept of preoperative therapy. And, and Isabel, I know that at, at Memorial, uh, you guys have really been pioneers and, and focused on the preoperative approach. I think there's some advantages of having that feedback of how your treatment's working. Whereas if you treat postoperatively, which is our current prevailing standard, you're essentially treating blind uh, based on the hope that you're going to effectively treat invisible microscopic disease that may or may not be there. But with preoperative, you get feedback. So, you know, you we have a better established standard of care for postoperative, got attractive but still early data for uh, preoperative therapy. What's is there a party line at Memorial on this? And you know, what's your personal view of the relative merits of giving treatments before versus after surgery? So I think you asked the million dollar question. Um, I, I definitely think there's two schools of thought and my school of thought is really about number one, prevention. So if you can decrease your risk, risk reduction and prevention is always where we should, you know, aim our, aim our focus. Um, but if you're talking about induction versus adjuvant therapy, there definitely are things that are attractive about induction um, or neoadjuvant or chemo and treatment before surgery. And one is that the patient, you know, did not just go through a major surgery. You're not worried about wound infection. You're not worried about delaying treatment, you know, to allow them to recover. Um, they're most of the time a little bit more robust because they have not just been in a hospital and had, you know, possibly post-op complications. Um, it's also very satisfying and nice to see the tumor shrink and have a better idea of, of how the patient is going to do with treatment. Um, it's also a nice thing to see that, you know, if for some reason you were to start treatment on a patient and catch a short interval scan and unfortunately you did not have favorable outcomes and your patient ended up developing metastatic disease, you would know before you started them, um, you know, you would know before you put them through a major surgery and remove part of their lung that they really would need, you know, down the road to allow them to tolerate treatment and, and help them maintain quality of life. So I think it has two positive things there. Um, then again, it's difficult to, you know, to determine is major pathologic response, um, does that correlate to overall survival? And I don't think we really know the exact data and we, we haven't really been able to link those two together to really say um, that it definitively does. But I'm definitely in, in, um, in the bucket of, of induction therapy, if it's possible. It's just difficult to get those, uh, those patients seen before they get taken to the OR. Right. I think one of the challenges is in the real world, surgeons have a patient in their office. They've got OR time next week. The patient very often just wants it out and i understand that and the surgeon at least going back 15 or 20 years when we were talking about sending off to chemo you know you can potentially have a patient go to surgery next week you can send them for chemo and maybe there's a complication or the cancer grows and they may never come back and so it's hard to take that risk versus just get it out now and worry about the rest after joan uh you know 15 years ago the world, we had a lot of trials of preoperative chemotherapy that looked promising. And then a bunch of postoperative chemo trials came out positive and essentially killed the concept. And, and are we potentially facing this again? I think that uh, there's a whole bunch of trials, both for preoperative and postoperative, that should be coming out now with immune therapy or targeted therapies, things like that in the next few years, but what's your perspective on the front door versus back door, you know, pre-op, post-op? So what happened 15 years ago was um, that we finally got definitive trials uh, showing that adjuvant therapy worked compared to no therapy at all. So we had those trials that showed a survival benefit. And that's when the interest in neoadjuvant 
therapy, neoadjuvant chemotherapy dropped because we had um, survival uh, benefit with adjuvant therapy. I think, I think Isabella has done an excellent job of describing the pros of uh, neoadjuvant therapy. Um, one of the disadvantages, I think, as you said, of neoadjuvant therapy, though, is the fact that the patient usually wants it out. And there always is the chance that it might grow during that period of time. Granted, it's a very small chance, but it's there nonetheless. Um, and it's ultimately doing, neo, at this point, doing neoadjuvant therapy doesn't really change very much, right? I mean, whether the patients had a major pathological response or not, we don't really know what to do with that data at this point in time. Nice. So once again, I think the proof's going to be in the pudding. We need to wait for survive, overall survival data. Yep. Great. 